This is Mike Malloy. He's a college student. In fact, he's attending class right now. He's an undergraduate student going for his BA degree at the University of Phoenix. But right now, he's in San Francisco. Actually, he's at work. But he's also going to class, getting updates from his professors, exchanging information with his fellow classmates, and doing it all online. Computers are changing the face of education in many, many ways. Today, we'll take a look at the computer as a learning tool on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard, working with industry leaders to ensure compatibility across the board and across the network. HPPCs, you're looking at partnership in a whole new light. Additional funding provided by the SPA, presenters of the annual Excellence in Software Awards. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee. With me today is Kenyon Scott, learning and multimedia specialist with Apple Computer. Kenyon, I've seen research that says that computers and multimedia actually help kids learn faster and better. Is that true and why? In my experience, yes, Stuart, it's true. And here's a great example of that today. One reason is because they can manipulate information in a very interactive way. We know that curiosity is a great catalyst for learning. So today, for example, we have a quick time movie of a carnival ride. And the question might be posed, well, where do you spend most of your time in this ride? At the top of the ride uh -huh. or at the bottom of the ride? Now, without technology, I could not have easily gathered data this way. But if I want to see how high I am at this point, I simply click the point, drag down to the ground, and now that green line signifies my distance. I can rapidly gather the rest of the information by clicking repeat. And so you can step through the video and actually pull data points down for each one of those frames. Precisely. And then what do you do with the data? Well, First of all, this reverses the whole time spent towards data gathering. It used to be data gathering was the most tedious and time-consuming aspect. Now mm -hmm. we can gather the da data quickly and can now quickly look at it and say... Really spend time on the analytical understanding part. Precisely. And so we can show it graphically. Here we'll take our graph um, and drag the height variable over here. So you can just grab the variables you want, your y-axis, your x-axis, uh -huh. et cetera. And then the, here we see presented graphically the uh -huh. same data. Now I can interact with this graph in such a way that takes me back to the original video. You touch a point on the graph and that shows you what's happening in the real world to represent that yes. point? Yes. Hmm. Now the way this would have done, say, before technology yeah. is we probably would have, would have been presented with a table of data, very dry data that you would have then... I remember that. Plot all the points, plot all the you know, points get all the data, then draw the graph. Didn't have a whole lot of meaning and wasn't it quite a, as a robust experience That's as great. this. I want to go back to school right now. All right, today we'll look at the computer as a teaching tool and show you four terrific new programs that can turn your PC into a classroom. There is so much interest in the educational benefits of computers these days that the San Jose School District recently decided to put together a trade show just for students and teachers to talk about educational computing. We showed up too. Anyone who attended the Electronic Learning Fair in San Jose, California, expecting to face the usual trade show hard sell, was in for a surprise. Instead of pushy salespeople and unruly crowds, the aisles were filled with excited children and parents struggling to keep up with them. The learning fair was presented by the San Jose Mercury News and featured 12 model classrooms divided by age group from preschool to high school. Keeping an eye on the classrooms were learning fair elves, a group of students helping parents and kids with computer problems. And in fact, one group of visitors did have problems. Some adult tasks, it's more adults than children because the children can figure out themselves and it's the adult when the adults ask um, how to use the software. The exhibit stands looked like extensions of the classrooms where kids could linger and learn. Vroom Books demonstrated Stratowakius the counting concert in which animated musical instruments teach counting, reading and spelling through 3D animations and games. The program contains an instrument factory with over 1,000 combinations and a parent's guide in four languages. Stratowakius is available for around $30. HarperCollins Interactive showed its American Sign Language Dictionary on CD-ROM, a $70 program that teaches kids how to sign using live-action video. The dictionary accepts input in five written languages and offers slow motion and detailed views of hand movements. On the hardware side, KidTech introduced a kid-sized input device called My First Keyboard for $119.
Kitek claims that even 18-month-old babies will be able to use the keyboard, which features big, colorful keys arranged alphabetically. One of the most unusual items on display was the Virtual Home Museum from Paragraph International, a Russian software developer. The Virtual Home Museum contains authoring tools for building and moving through rooms or other 3D worlds, which can be decorated with patterns or moving images. The CD-ROM program includes digital artwork to hang on the walls of your house, as well as animation and sound. Kids had different reasons for coming to the fair, but in many cases, the motivation was the same. Because it's more of a hands-on kind of thing where they can go through and play with it themselves and really get a feel for stuff that they can do. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. When you see a software program called Grammar Games, you figure this must be an oxymoron. How could you have fun learning about grammar? It also would seem like a difficult subject for a computer, but here to prove me wrong, presumably, is Faye Schwartz of Davidson & Associates. How do I learn grammar using the computer in the software, Faye? Well, we hope that you learn it well, and we <laughs> do hope that you have fun using it. In fact, that's one of the major things we think we can provide, is fun and motivation for a topic that has been kind of tedious yeah. and kind of neglected, frankly. So you've got four different games in here. Let's go through them all. We do, actually. We're in the rainforest, and we start with Jungle Gizmo. Jungle Gizmo is an activity that focuses on plurals and possessives, which is mm -hmm. a real problem spot for some people. Um, the student has to enter plurals so and possessives. What's the plural of avocado? Well, I think it's avocados. Sort of like and I, potato and potatoes. And huh? I think I spelled it right. I did. Now, All right. since this is a demo, we're okay. going to use the magic key. We're going to cheat, go ahead to the big finish. So if I'm really doing it, this would be sort of my reward. I get to mm. see this little after 20, game. After 20 correct answers. Okay. Right. So let's go to the next lesson. Okay. Let's look at falling fruit, which is our punctuation mm -hmm. activity. Uh, before we go, we see that we get a scoreboard after every activity. Since I'm a continuing student, it's monitoring me, it's keeping track of me. I had a diagnostic test, told me what to mm. study. I also have an opportunity here to go to the grammar guide, which is a huge grammar reference behind the scenes in the program. You can go yeah. to it anytime, find okay. out what you're missing. Uh, in this program, in this, in this activity, we have to find the correct punctuation for the end of this sentence. So I'm looking for a period there. We're looking for a period. So I've got to get this little toucan to catch a period coming we down. We started huh? the magic there's a, there's fruit there, falling. There's a period. Oh, oh but, but I, period. I want to see what happens. Oh, there. When uh, he, there's a period coming. When he, uh, yeah, All right. he ate the right one. He spit it into the sentence, and we're, we're on our way. Okay, so, so what's the third game we can play? The third game we can play is Hidden, Hidden Wonders. wonders. And what, what do you learn here? Hidden Wonders is probably our most challenging mm. activity. Uh, this consists of passages, uh, stories, adventure stories about the rainforest, and we have to edit them to make yeah, them so correct. One of the goals of my journey has yet to be fulfilled, you're, I would say, teach. You're quite good at this, okay. actually. Oh, the the about the lives. About live. Oh, live, yes. This is really good. Only yeah. one anaconda, so a lot of subject for agreement he here. Me. He tells yeah. me there are. Let's fix one okay. more, and then we'll see the Hidden Wonders. And then again, we get some sort of reward for doing that. We get flowers blooming, we get okay. birds flying, we get leopards and tigers and all sorts of things. There's a blue frog in here that we didn't see this all time. All right, so let's go to Rainforest Rescue. This is really a neat game in which, again, uh, you learn grammar, but you really solve a problem at the same time. Absolutely. Here we have a rainforest in distress. Okay, I know you've got to answer, think about these questions, so I'll explain <laughs> it. You take right. the test here. All right. all right. What you're trying to do here is decide whether these are full sentences or sentence fragments. Exactly. Uh, and take a look at them and carefully decide, and if you get enough mm -hmm. right, you get enough fuel in your helicopter helicopter and you exactly. can go in and rescue uh, that rainforest. We see a bulldozer mowing down those trees oh. and there's a fire starting somewhere yes. and there's an oh. animal in distress. That's right. And you've got to keep on, okay, gotta you've got, to, on got enough right answers. We have enough, oh, see if we can catch our uh, bulldozer before it goes off the oh. screen. You know, I think okay. we, we missed it. We've got a little it. animal that over there, a little red guy. Can we save yeah. him? We've got to save the, uh, save the animal, get him into the safe area. Oh, and he, he squeals with delight when That's we pick great. him up. All right, we put him in the safe area. Here comes another bulldozer. We're going to get him this time. Okay. We're going to take him to the bulldozer graveyard <laughs> where he will uh, cause no more trouble. That's really nicely done. What, what age group would this be for, Faye? This is for anybody from age 10 on up. So adults okay. could have fun with this, pro with this program. A lot of depth in it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, so when you think about computers and teaching, well, mathematics seems a natural. After all, that's what computers do. But can you make teaching math fun and interesting? Well, we found one program that does. It's called Tangible Math. And the woman who helped design it is Dr. Cheetah Duval. Hi, Cheetah. Sarah. Yes. Okay, now Tangible Math, in fact, is a collection of different math yes. programs, isn't it? it? There are six programs in the, in the series. And this one I have up on the screen is called the Probability Constructor. The idea is to make math tangible, to have objects to play with, manipulate, collect information, analyze it, and understand otherwise abstract Get symbols. away from the abstractions exactly. and the formulas and relate it to the real world. Exactly. All right, show me how you do that with this one. Okay, the constructor has six uh, possible models. We'll choose the coin. And what I've done here is open a table showing frequency and so forth. And here you can see the probability that one out of two is your chance of getting a head or a right. tail. This bar graph, and graphing is an important component of learning, shows us that the theoretical probability mm -hmm. is also one out of two. I run the experiment, and I can watch this bar graph displaying the results of each toss. And you would guess here that You're I'm having so on Whoa, tails, there's but a head, there's okay. a head. Another head. And the graph is being updated after each coin. So this is really a little laboratory. We can do experiments exactly. and again see real world consequences of mathematical right. concepts like probability. And unlike real life, you can bias the coins. You can toss a thousand coins. And if we go over here to the demo of mm -hmm. this product, we can pick up um, one of those instances where we've sort of canned the uh, outcomes uh -huh. for presentation. Tossing one coin are heads or tails. The probability of each is one out of two. But what if we tossed two coins? <laughs> okay. Okay, now what's going to happen here is that we're going to toss two coins. And as I run the demo, you will see the table changing to show the outcomes, outcomes of two, to two, heads, uh, two mm -hmm. coins, that's hard to say. And, and also and uh, demonstrating and a tree tails. diagram so that if now we change the, the number tree, of coins see where the from two, where the odds are one out of four for any outcome, if I go to three, the odds change to one out of eight because I have that many more possibilities. So students can actually see what the possibilities are instead of my trying to raise my hands. I want, to ask, I want to ask you to show me one other element okay. of tangible math, which is the algebra animator, because that's also a good example of how you, you relate mathematics to the real world. Exactly. This product, uh, the animator, is designed to give a face to algebraic equations using models that students can attach to equations. Variables in the equation define how an object will mm -hmm. move, and in algebra, so instead of just dealing with equations and, and abstractions and even word problems, you can actually create the problems right. here in the computer. So you can work from the model to the equation to understand it, or you can work from the equation to see how the model right. behaves given those definitions. So like in, in math, we have the problem that one train is coming from north to south, <laughs> and one is south to north, one's going 50 miles an hour, and one's going 60 miles an hour. When are they going to meet? Exactly. Okay. But and here I can actually do it. Here you can do it. With butterflies. In this case, you'll see okay. butterflies. Each of them is <laughs> attached to an equation. And what we're going to do is send them on their way. And as they move, we can begin to develop an understanding of what these variables mean. And here they come. We can trap their point of intersection, which is the point of solving equations. Mm -hmm. And in this particular um, experiment, then students can develop an understanding for what is motion and what are these equations useful for. That is really great. Yeah, it's really a lot of fun. And in this particular uh, experiment, you can even create your own uh, tangible math experiences. You study gravity and drop things from trees exactly, and all that kind of stuff. Exactly, and I think that's um, what we have here with the basketball, if we can get it to run here, and mm -hmm. there it comes. We've oriented the picture differently by choosing the objects menu here, choose a basketball, attach an equation Let's to it. The falling object will uh -huh. reflect the effect of right. gravity, and there you have it. That's great. Tangible math. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, what are computers good at? Keeping track of lots of data. What is a library full of? Lots of data. No surprise then that one of the really valuable uses of computers in education is in the library. And one of the leaders in using the technology is the San Mateo County Library System right here in Northern California. San Mateo County on the San Francisco Peninsula is giving its library patrons a chance to be their own librarians. Readers can search for a book across the county system, reserve it if it's checked out, and have the volume delivered to the closest branch within a day or two. The new electronic card catalog is called the Peninsula Library's Automated Network, or PLANET, and it replaces more than just dog-eared paper cards. There's a lot of things that people like to do for themselves. Not only that they can do it and it saves money as far as the staff time, but they like to do it. 
So they like to have access to their own record. They like to look up things them themselves. They like to print out what they are uh, looking up and, and save that information. They might use it later. So as many features as we could look at that would allow someone to do more things on their own and then save, in a sense, the librarian's time for us to help you with the things that we're trained to do and that we do very well. The difference between Planet and a paper card catalog is clear from the start. Along with traditional choices of author, title, and subject, readers can search by keywords and multiple indexes. Often, the author's last name and a partial title are enough to locate the work. Planet can perform an extensive subject search or limit its exploration by date or locality. The system accommodates foreign language titles, which can be combined with English subject headers. Librarians were concerned that the newly computerized card catalog might overwhelm their patrons, but the response was quite different. In fact, our staff had gathered a bunch of volunteers who were going to act as like library docents, helpers in the library, and we would be training them so they would help someone. Do you need some help using the new computer? Let us show you some of the aspects of it. After the first week of installation, our staff came back to me and said, I don't think we need our docent program. We have been walking the floor asking people to help them. We show them one or two things, and then they say, that's fine, you can go away now, I'll help myself. San Mateo plans to extend Planet to become part of the local internet hub, leaping over state and geographical boundaries. But for now, patrons are happy just to reserve a book in one branch, find it in another, and have it delivered to a third. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. So you've spent your time at the library, you've studied hard at school, now it's time to apply for college, and that means taking the dreaded SAT. If there was ever a good job for a computer, SAT preparation is it. Here to show us inside the SAT is Carrie Hoyt of the Princeton Review. All right, now when you're taking the SAT, there's two things involved. One is your substantive verbal and math skills, but the other thing is really your test-taking skills, right? Do you teach both of those? Yes, we do. In our program, we, we teach both the math and the verbal, and also test-taking techniques and strategies. The Princeton Review is the largest SAT company, and we see over 30,000 students a year and help them out on the SATs. And I'll show you some strategies now. All right, so we'll go in the little strategies room? Mm-hmm. We're going to go into general Secrets strategies. Secrets of passing the SAT. <laughs> Secrets of the SAT. Right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so if you look in here, we're going to go into um, the average test taker, and his name is Joe Bloggs. It's very important to know when you're taking the SAT, who is the average test taker? We have named him Joe Bloggs. Okay. He's scoring about a 500 in math and about, about a 500 in verbal. So these are these dreaded analogy questions, right? <laughs> yes. We're going to be doing an analogies question right now. Okay. And you can see they're just introducing who Joe Bloggs is. And you can see here that we're going to get into a difficult analogy. And when we see Joe Bloggs, um, this is a difficult analogy, and he might not know what deport means. So deport is to country as? As. We have to find the same answer choice down here. Now Joe Bloggs, the average test taker, does not know what deport means. So what he does is he looks at country and he says, okay, I know what country means. What answer choice is, reminds me of country? Nation. And what's the answer choice to yeah. you? It's going to be nation. Good. So if we pick nation, such as the average test taker would, you will see that Joe Name Bloggs blocks. pops out. Joe Bloggs. And that, we don't want to be Joe Bloggs. We use that as right. a mnemonic device to help okay. our students. But let's look at the real answer, and expel that is going to be expel to school. to school. And if we pick that, we have yeah. that's the right answer choice. Okay. okay. Um, so you really do learn not to do the dumb things, basically, and to really think cleverly and get into the minds of the guy who wrote the test question. Right, right. We want to know who wrote this test, and that's ETS. And it, a good strategy okay, on Okay, so that. how about the substantive skills, like those horrible paragraphs you have to read and then answer the questions about the paragraph? That's afterward. called critical reading. Okay. It's actually not that horrible. <laughs> if we look in here, we'll see that we're going to um, talk about what exactly is in critical reading. Mm -hmm. And basically that is. It's a passage and you have to answer about th five to seven questions afterwards. Okay, and again, again it give you some hints about smart ways to deal with these right, questions. Right, huh? right. And here we have um, a question called vocabulary and context. And we have the words blotted out in line 12 most nearly mean. So what our job as a test taker is to go down to here and find that in this sentence. And we have the sun was blotted out entirely for mm -hmm. two days within a hundred mile radius. What do you think blotted out would mean? I would in say that obscured C. Obscured C. So if we pick that, 
You're all right, I got right. in. You're going to get into the best college. All right, now okay. speaking of which, you have this, this counselor section in mm -hmm. here in which I can get a sense of what scores do I really need, what my, what my goal should be on the SAT, depending on where I want to go, right? Exactly. If we go into the guidance counselor's room, you're going to see here that there's a lot more than just um, SAT test-taking mm -hmm. strengths and we, um, test-taking techniques and strategies. We have the counselor here. He might need some counseling himself. <laughs> if we go into you versus the world, you're going to see that this is uh, the averages of the SAT of the schools. Okay, so these, um, these are the typical scores or the, the, the mean or median right, scores? Right, these are averages. Okay. So you could be a little bit below, you could be a little bit behind. Now I've put our scores in as a 480 in verbal okay. and a 540 in math. All right, so suppose I wanted to go to Arizona State University. For Arizona example. State University. So, these uh, are the average scores, so we could probably get into I get Arizona in with those State numbers because that's higher than numbers. their average. What, suppose right. I want to go to Barnard, for example. Okay. They take men these days? I don't know. <laughs> Let's say I want to go to Barnard. We're going to have to work a little bit harder to get Whoa. in there. So yeah. we are going to have to work on our SAT scores, um, but there's also they're yeah. looking at the GPA and uh -huh. your extracurricular right. activities, other things. These are the averages, but we are going to have to work a little bit on our program for that. Okay, that's great. Inside the SAT. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Okay. Now, computers can do more than teach the three R's. They can teach the fun stuff, too, like art and music. One of the neatest teaching programs we found in this category was the musical world of Professor Piccolo. Jim Hannon is vice president of Opcode International, the company that makes Professor Piccolo. And show us how this works, Jim. Well, what you see here is an interactive music town. And there are seven different buildings. And you can enter any building and learn a lot about music. OK, suppose I went to Symphony Hall. What would I learn in there? Well, first of all, you hear the orchestra tuning up, and there are a variety of tools on the right-hand side for you to learn even more about the symphony. You can press the range button and see the range of different instruments mm -hmm. in the symphony. You can press the forms button, and here's the full Haydn Symphony Number no. 88 in CD quality audio. We press on the second theme, and you can hear that. So I can actually listen to Haydn's Symphony No. 88, and the program tells me what part of it is, whether a theme is being repeated. That, Correct. That, that sort of theory stuff inside That's right, it. and you can look in the text window down here, and that's, that's explained. Great. You could also go to the second theme in the recapitulation and hear it again, or go to the coda. So it, it shows you musical form. Uh -huh. There's also a history button, <laughs> which shows you the history of the symphony orchestra. There's an overview button where you can interactively go over the symphony orchestra or the layout of the symphony orchestra, uh -huh. press the mouse, and hear the sound. Hear the those, sound. Those or if we went to the snare drum, for example, you mm -hmm. could hear that. We can use the magnifying tool, too, to go over any instrument, press it, and now you see the instrument and mm -hmm. hear a selection from it. So it's a great way to choose an instrument or, or learn more about it. Can one. we go to the rock club and see what I would learn about rock music you in the bet. program, too? Sure thing. Now the buttons in the Rock Club are similar to what you just saw in the Symphony Hall. We have the same tools available to us. Mm -hmm. Now we can play a rock piece. And most recordings multi-track, so we could play individual tracks. Here's the synthesizer track. If we wanted to find out more about the synthesizer, we could press on the synthesizer and hear a musical selection hmm. featuring this synthesizer as well as a history of it, yeah. a picture, the controls and displays. Can you see the structure of the music and the rock just the way you do in the symphonic music? Definitely. Let's go to that. And here we have a pop song hmm. with different verses, choruses. So you hear the verse right. and then you can go to the chorus section. Mm -hmm. So it's a full uh, rock piece. Mm -hmm. And you can hear how the chorus fades out at the end. And in that music school part, in the, in the bottom right there in your sort of town, you actually can learn music theory and... and it's a full interactive music theory course, uh -huh. 12 lessons. And uh, I'll show you what okay. you can see there. There are 12 lessons, and it can keep track <laughs> of up to 30 students' progress. Hmm. So you can learn about notation, pitch, intervals, scales. If we went to scales, you'll see the interactivity. So it really is a full introduction to music course, really. That's right. That it's the equivalent of a full semester music theory yeah. course. That's great. Love it. So. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank All right. You. That's our look at learning on a computer. Remember, you can learn more about us online by checking out the Computers on Television forum on CompuServe. The command is Go Chronicles. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stuart Chaffee. See you here next time on the Computer Chronicles. Thank you.
Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard. Developing technology that lets you manage your PC from anywhere on the network, anywhere in the world. HP PCs, you're taking a close look at remote management. Additional funding provided by the SPA, presenters of the annual Excellence in Software Awards. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated and information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a newsletter, call 1-800-800-9520 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. All orders include a free software program for auditing software use and information on the definitive guide to keeping your organization software legal. Everyone called it Chicago, and now it's officially Windows 95. It's the new operating system from Microsoft. Multimedia in Windows 95 has never been easier. Through autoplay, all I have to do is take the CD-ROM that has an autoplay-enabled application, put it in the CD-ROM, close it, and even a four-year-old can now use multimedia. A preview of the new Windows and the applications that take advantage of it on the next Computer Chronicles.